Good evening, everyone. I am Yusuf Hashmi from Team Taxman, and I welcome you all to today's live webinar on external commercial borrowers. But before we proceed, I shall take this opportunity to briefly introduce Taxman. We are India's leading publisher of tax and corporate laws, committed to delivering our users the most authentic and enriching experience. Our goal is to simplify the research and compliance for the legal community. Our unwavering dedication to our vision has driven us to work tirelessly over the past six decades, providing innovative solutions that help our clients grow their tax practice and achieve new heights. We have also developed and maintained the national website of the Income Tax Department with the assistance of our skilled tech team and editorial team. And now everyone, please welcome our esteemed speaker, CA Nikki Shah. She is a highly experienced business consultant and C-suite advisor who operates from a unique vantage point of combining her experience as an investment banker, chartered accountant, business advisor, and registered value. Her expertise includes helping companies raise capital, getting their finances and compliances in order, and creating value in their businesses. She is also a passionate speaker, presenter, and a content creator, having spoken at various conferences and events. Her favorite topics include creating value from ideas and making companies investor ready. Welcome, Ms. Shah. It is our pleasure to have you with us. Before we begin, here are a few tips for the audience. Your mic will be on mute during the session. However, you can post your queries in the chat box, chat box provided. Your speakers will answer the questions either during or after the session. A copy of this presentation will be shared to you via email for future reference. Without further ado, I would request Ms. Shah to address the audience. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Yusuf. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. It is always nice and interesting to hear our own self from somebody else's mouth. So thank you again for that. And we will just quickly begin. Just give me a confirmation that you can, you and the audiences can hear me well. Thank you. Thank you. I love this thumbs up going on during the conversation because that's the only way I come to know that yes, I am audible and I have not made the audiences bow down and see. Thank you so much. So keep coming up in between. So here we begin with an international uh, topic and which is very, very interesting as well, as well uh, called as external commercial borrowing. So we are gonna be taking up today a content in form of two aspects. One, we are gonna be covering up the legal aspect of it. At the same time, we are also gonna be covering up an understanding who, how, when can use external commercial borrowing and at the same time, knowing recently who are actually using it, what is the current trend that is there in the ECB sector, which will help us understand, develop our own practice, or maybe help our clients determine when and from whom they should raise the capital. So let's dive into the topic deeper. I plan to answer these questions today. Who can raise external commercial borrowings? Who, from whom you can take it, for what purpose you can use it, what are the criteria that I need to fulfill if I need to raise capital, external commercial borrowing or ECB, uh, what are the compliances that I need to make sure that the company undergoes or complies to make sure that FEMA or the RBI department does not knock my door. So let's understand those areas. As we begin, and most of you here uh, hearing this must be aware that FEMA is Foreign Exchange Management Act. FEMA is pretty different from other acts because most of the cases, if you refer to an act, it governs you everything. But FEMA is a bit different in that aspect as FEMA is not only governed by act. In fact, if you go to the act, it is less than seven pages. It is more so driven by notifications and regulation. Hence, for this as well, you have to refer to FEMA's regulation, which is on borrowing and lending, which is nothing other than FEMA 3R. You also need to refer to the master direction, which covers up entirely all the framework and the policies and stuff around it in master direction number five. And you also need to refer to the guarantee regulation, FEMA number eight. If we have referred to these three regulations, we can rest assured that everything relevant to FEMA is what we are aware of. Now, before I work and move ahead a little more deeper, I need to understand the audience. So if I can use the chat box, people who have dealt with ECB earlier or are planning or have raised the funds, can I receive a thumbs up so that I know how many people have dealt with it and I can take up a little more advance 
or else i will start with the basics and make sure i've covered every aspect and every participant at the end of the session are aware with all the basics of the fema okay fair enough thank you so much i will make sure i cover up each and every basics that's what i understand from the responses that i received uh if we look up for any businesses there are two types of capital that is required one is the owner's own capital and the other is a borrowed capital today we are going to be talking everything about which is a part of the borrowed capital as soon as we move to the borrowed capital which is anything other than equity preference shares those capital are have an option that either you can borrow it within india or you can borrow it from the outside of india so current topic that we are going to be focuses upon is only on the capital or the money that is borrowed from outside of india and hence as the name suggests external commercial borrowing as i said before we go into the law let's understand the practical aspects and let's understand what has been happening around so most on an average a thousand ecbs are raised every year so if you guys are professionals and listening to this conversation then yes there is business for all of us thousand ecbs implies a lot of compliance is followed with it too secondly uh, ecbs are also in demand because of the interest rate benefits that the borrower gets secondly thirdly rather there is a lot of liberalization that has come over the years and the amount of money that can be raised via the ecb also has increased in fact before i go deeper there's an interesting case which i would like to bring to the attention of my audience today uh, usually there is a limit of 750 million usd which is what a, a company can raise recently rbi had raised this limit for a specific period of time say for example the limit was raised from september 22 till december 22 and the limit was increased from 750 million usd to 1 and 1/2 billion dollars during this period also the all in cost ceiling the rate the of interest that can be paid was also increased so we tried to analyze this was the data which specifically came to our notice when we were trying to prepare this content and understand and analyze on the utilization and the borrowing that was made we realized that during this period we went further and said let us understand how many people took the advantage of uh, this increased limit for a specific period of time wherein the interest rate was also increased amount was also increased to our analysis we realized that specifically during this period reliance jio were in talks to raise global uh, funds that is ecb to the extent of 1.5 billion for their analysis we realized that yes during this period reliance was the one who took the major advantage of the increased ecb ah i don't think i should say anything further is this quite understanding that uh, we as government helping entrepreneurs a lot to make sure that they grow quite well but if we look at the overall data bearing a few exceptions aside what we see is that ecb uh, can be borrowed for a particular purposes and the analysis of the past data says that majority of the companies that have been raising the capital via the external commercial borrowing route is specifically for working capital purposes majorly if the company is looking out for growth and expansion then they need it for new projects or modernization or working capital these are the three major areas which constitute more than 50% of the ecb borrowing that has happened over the last quarter second important purpose is okay so then uh, Who, from whom are they raising money so what the analysis shows that most of the funds that has been raised over the last quarter is from their own foreign equity holder or rather the foreign collaborators they contribute to more than 67% of the borrowings that has happened in the past quarter and the third important thing which we need to understand is who are the sectors or which are the major sectors which are taking the advantage of uh, ecb in the practical scenario we could analyze that majority advantage is taken either by the financial service sectors 
to raise cheaper funds outside via the route of ecb and utilize and further on lending into indian services basically the financial service sector contribute to 44% the second biggest sector which is taking the advantage is the manufacturing sector as i mentioned more so from working capital modernization or new projects perspective manufacturing sectors are also taking a huge advantage of the ecb and the third uh, sector is the information service sector this are the people who are currently taking the advantage of ecb as the trend is showing based on the last quarter so this was a bit of a practical understanding of who are raising for what purposes and from where now let us come to more of the legal aspect of it and understand what does the law around ecb says as to who can take it and from where and how so first of all let us understand a basic simple criteria of who is an ecb as we said any loan that can be raised by a resident indian or a eligible resident entity and that can be raised from anybody outside india who is again a recognized eligible uh, non resident entity then that loan transaction is called as an external commercial borrow but as i said there are parameters law says you want to take it please do so but within the four corners of the law i will tell you what all conditions you need to comply with if you comply to those conditions then only you can go ahead and take the loan uh, if you do not comply to those conditions then your loan is not under automatic route you need to come to rbi for approval and then post that based on your case rbi will approve the case especially in terms of the borrowing rule fema 3r very clearly says that uh, whatever i am allowing in the law that are only the transactions which are allowed to be done anything which is not specifically allowed those things cannot be done so fema is broadly covered into two categories as capital account transactions and current account transactions capital account transactions are those transactions which we are dealing it right now like the external commercial borrowing current account transactions are those transactions which we deal it in day to day life maybe import transaction or payment of royalty or payment of few subscription fees or some um, regular expense item rbi says everything uh, is allowed in the current account transaction except for the one which we specifically say not allowed whereas vice versa is the case of capital account transaction which is like the case of ecb rbi says whatever i want to allow is what we have allowed you within the laws within the master directions 3r and all the regulations that they are talking about whichever is not specifically allowed in those transactions are not allowed so hey don't do that so that's the caution word before we go further now when we are looking at ecb we need to understand that ecb comes in two forms either you can borrow the money and agree to repay the money only in foreign currency borrowing happened in foreign currency and we said we will repay also in foreign currency irrespective of what is the dollar rate or what is the uh, change in the rate that is called as foreign currency denominated ecb which is in simple form we'll call it as sty you know, short form second is uh, inr denominated ecb you will borrow it in rupees and you say that we will repay it in the rupee form in the form of how much rupees we have received say for example you received 5 lakh dollars getting converted into say 40 crore then inr denominated ecb agreement will say that 40 crore will be repaid irrespective of the change in the currency so that is the basic difference between fcy which is a foreign currency denominated ecb and inr denominated ecb both will allow you in the form of fixed or floating rates bonds debentures any optionally or Uh, uh non convertible instrument will be covered under ecb everything which is fully convertible into equity whether it is compulsory convertible debt or compulsory convertible preference shares those will form part of equity anything wherein there is an option there is a chance that it may not get converted into equity all those instruments will automatically get covered under ecb that's a simple funda uh, <clears throat> just an additional the difference is there between foreign currency and inr ecb is the preference shares which is allowed if there is an inr denominated ecb rest 
you have trade credits beyond three years, financial issues, both all of it will covered under ECB. Obviously, if it's a foreign currency convertible bond, then it automatically gets converted into FCY ECB because the name suggests the same. And similarly, if the company is issuing a rupee denominated bond overseas, then since it's a rupee denominated, it automatically gets converted into INR ECB. Now, since we know, okay, which are the two types of ECB, the next question that comes up is who can do the borrowing? So the question is, who are the eligible borrowers? The answer is pretty simple. All the entities that are eligible to receive FDI are allowed to uh, borrow uh, ECB. So that's the simple fund. Second to that, they have added that port trust units in SCZ, SIDB and Exim Bank, they are also allowed to raise ECB. Further to that, they are saying that those entities which are registered entities in microfinance, uh, like and registered non-for-profit companies or trust cooperative societies, these are also eligible to raise ECB provided it is an INR rated ECB. Now the question comes up, what if a registered port foreign portfolio investor is investing in a non-convertible debenture? So ideally we said that a non-convertible debenture covers under ECB. But if the foreign registered foreign portfolio investment, that is a registered foreign portfolio investment and SPI is there, then that does not get covered under the ECB framework. They do not have to follow the guidelines, even if they uh, subscribe or apply for a non-convertible debenture. That is a specific exemption which has been given in the law to ease down their operation. There is another question which comes up and it's a lot of time we have been hearing this controversy and question coming up is that are LLPs, because today a lot of businesses are happening in LLPs further. Uh, so question comes up whether ECB can be borrowed uh, in an LLP. So whether LLPs are eligible to borrow ECB. I will not pause it as a question because it is as screen on the screen that LLPs are not eligible for uh, raising ECB, though they can raise uh, FDI if the sector is permitting, but uh, for borrowing, LLPs are today not permitted as an eligible entity. Now that we know that who are eligible to take the borrowings, uh, we have to also understand that from whom can we take the borrowings. So obviously as the first pie chart that I showed, that the first and the foremost and the maximum use uh, lender is your own foreign equity holder or uh, collaborator. So anybody who wants to take, they are the first priorities. Secondly, you can also go to any multilateral and regional financial institution where India is a member. From there also it can be raised or foreign branches or subsidiaries of Indian banks. But that is only for foreign currency ECB. They, uh, except for that, they can participate as uh, underwriters and market makers for rupee denominated bonds. But majority cases may, as I said, that foreign equity holders are the ones who are used uh, for raising ECB in the maximum time. Now, hence it becomes equally important to understand that who are the foreign equity holders. Uh, let's understand the definition and understand who are the foreign equity holders. Uh, who are eligible from whom the Indian company can raise funds. So first of all, that foreign equity holder has to directly have 25% holding in the borrowing entity. Secondly, if he is not my direct equity holder, then if there is an indirect equity holding, then in that scenario, the holding has to be around 51%. That is the two criteria. The third criteria says, if there is a group company, then with a common parent company, in that scenario also, uh, he will be considered as a foreign equity holder. If I give you an example to understand, see direct equity holder is pretty simple to understand if you're holding more than 25%, you can raise funds from them. Now we need to understand what is an indirect equity holder. Say for example, there's a Mr. A who is a foreign resident. He's holding 100% in a Dubai company. And that Dubai company is further step down investing 51% into the Indian company. Now, my question is whether this is considered as an indirect holding 
whether this comply as indirectly holding 15% and mr a will be allowed to invest into indian company if the indian company was raising funds from dubai 100% it would be allowed but now the question is that mr a is going to be uh, giving funds to indian company what do the audience think please give me uh, a chat box answer do you think yes type yes if you think that yes it covers the guidelines of indirect holding and he would be allowed uh, to raise funds indian company will be allowed to raise funds from mr a so rajesh is saying yes that's his view there is another guy saying yes i think yes manoj is saying yes shridharan is yes Uh, i liked i think i will go ahead with the answer of i think yes because even i think it is yes uh, it's an indirect holding and it will be allowed but now i want to take the conversation one step further and tell me say for example during this tenure you know this holding is there and uh, mr a or dubai company say for example reduces his investment and his investment in indian company is now say for example 45% at the time of raising the ecb he was having 51% but say after two months of raising the equity the uh, the uh, the they they dubai company say for example offloaded the shares and now their share holding in the indian company has reduced to 50 from 51% to say 46% now what is the answer of the audience do you think that there is any violation or it is not allowed okay ramesh is quite fast he's saying no not allowed i'm waiting for others manoj is saying not allowed yes yes uh shridharan has of the view yes 25% equity holding rest all says no not allowed so here the law says that you need to keep the holding uh, same if you would have seen the fourth box it says disposal of the share holding not allowed during the tenure of the loan now this is not a blanket not allowed it is trying to say that you are not allowed to dispose of if you are not complying with the criteria of allowed so if you are allowed initially you need to maintain that holding that compliance needs to be maintained till you are having the last rupee of the ecb into your company and it's being used so be better be careful now we move to the next point now we know from who can take it from whom you can take it uh, we've understood the definitions then the next important point to understand is okay for what purpose can i use or are there any restrictions for which i cannot use so yes as i mentioned rbi has a very brief negative list one it says you cannot use it for real estate activity and it has very very clearly defined what is a real estate activity if you are going to be constructing a property uh, and uh, then going to be selling it then it is not a real estate activity but if you intend to just buy and trade it or lease it out then it will be getting covered under the real estate activity and hence not allowed uh, i am sure ye ek uh non allowances pay a uh, lot of hearts are broken of the builders that now we will not be able to use this route also the ecb route getting stopped also stopped a lot of structuring and opportunity for builders sector uh, second is investment in capital market again you cannot raise the funds via ecb invest in capital market i don't think rbi still has so much of trust on our capital market and it says please don't do that so not allowed third is equity investment now here it is very interesting to understand uh, the brackets it is written domestic the law does not say domestic per se in this manner it is reading of the other provisions and an implication and hence for better understanding i have put it here in the brackets what does it mean rbi says that if the indian company wants to borrow funds from say example will make it easier from their foreign equity holder they can do it but now if you want to reinvest which we call it as step down investment or the down flow of investment now we want to step down invest into any company in india rbi says you are not allowed to do it then go to that step down subsidiary or that step down subsidiary and see 
whether they are complying with the ecb laws if they are then ask them to directly raise the funds you can't ask the holding company to raise the funds or further for that matter the parent company or any company above to uh, level 1 company to raise the funds and then go in for step down investment via equity but at the same time rbi says if you want to if the indian company want to raise funds from the foreign equity holder and then make an equity investment outside india which is odi then rbi says allowed not a problem you can raise in ecb use that funds for equity investments for any company outside india which is odi that is allowed but if you want to do it in step down form rbi says no you ask your step down company to check the compliances if they are eligible ask them to raise it directly rbi does not say the restriction says further it says the working capital uh, icb proceeds cannot be used for working capital purposes except for foreign equity holder so as we said from majority cases if you are raising from your foreign equity holder you can use this for working capital purposes general corporate purposes or your rupee of repayment loans and uh, on lending to entities uh, for the above activities is not allowed except for as i said that today lot of nbfcs are using this uh, opportunity for raising funds and uh, for on lending purposes uh, this as we said majority of the nbfcs are making the advantage of this purpose of this provision now we understand what is refinancing of ecb so refinancing of ecb is that you are going to be raising a fresh ecb to make the repayment of an existing ecb now whether that is permitted or not rbi says yes refinancing of ecb is permitted but subject to conditions nothing from rbi comes without a condition so let us understand what are those conditions first is it says humko koi nuksan nahi hona chahiye there should be no reduction in the outstanding maturity of the original borrowing cost kam nahi honi chahiye all in cost fresh ecb should not be lower than the all in cost of the existing ecb multiple borrowing agar hai to weighted average karke dekho uh, the only thing precisely what they are also trying to say is you cannot refinance an inr ecb with an foreign currency ecb because yahan pe inr mein hai to your you know your foreign currency uh, they have not calculated or so so they are very clear which they are making it clear via an faq that refinancing of an inr ecb with a foreign currency ecb is not permitted rest you can do it subject to the conditions uh as i said what usage you can do for the business uh, financing by using ecb is you can borrow a large volume uh, for a long term you can have a lower cost of funds because the all in costs uh, is there and at the same time the foreign currencies are usually at a cheaper rates you can diversify your investor base you can use this money for the expansion modernization and all now again an important uh, topic that needs an important parameter or a term uh, which is very very peculiar to ecb that needs to be understood and which is called as the minimum average maturity first of all let us understand what is an minimum average maturity rbi says that if you are raising funds then you need to comply with the minimum average maturity you can have a higher or a longer maturity so if you are taking the funds you can have a maturity period beyond what has been mentioned but you cannot repay it earlier than what we have told you like for example if there is a manufacturing company which is raising ecb and is raising ecb up to usd 50 million then it can repay it after a year but if you say that i want to raise the funds right now and repay it within 6 months then is it allowed rbi says no not allowed you need to comply with the minimum average maturity uh, plan so what are those minimum average maturity for each case needs to be understood so first of all uh, first uh, basic one is that manufacturing companies if those manufacturing companies are raising capital ecb and that to only up to 50 million usd this is uh, per year then in that case it is uh, one year which is the minimum average maturity period if you are raising it from your foreign equity holder then in that case rbi says okay you have to keep it minimum for 5 years if you are holding it for anybody other than your foreign equity holder any anybody else or you rather if we say that your purpose is different you know your purpose is for capex purposes then your minimum average maturity is 7 years 
and for any other purposes it is 10 years now again your if the purpose and from whom you are raising is not mentioned in this table in that scenario your minimum average maturity period will be 3 years this is if the people who have would have experienced uh, taking the ecb approval from or you know you would have done compliances with your ad banker you would have realized the the first and the foremost thing that ad bankers will check is the minimum average maturity calculation and to make sure that this calculation is in uh, sync and all the people are having a clarity on this front rbi has gone one ahead one step ahead and rbi has also uh, uh, issued a document you uh, if you would click on the link you would find that uh, rbi has this excel sheet wherein uh, the calculation has been precisely mentioned here so for example if i say that minimum average maturity is 5 years it does not mean that you cannot make a repayment in the first year or the second year repayment in the first and the second year is allowed but your average maturity calculation should be over the period that has been prescribed hence if you go ahead and use this sheet wherein you will have the drawal at what rates and what dates you are withdrawing drawing the ecb amount when you plan to make the repayment uh rest all will follow as an automated calculation then in that case you will get your answer as what is the average maturity like in this case the average maturity is 3.2 now if the average maturity is 3.2 years and this is falling within the criteria of you know minimum average to be of 3 years the ad bankers will allow this repayment schedule and my ecb will be approved but if for example i make any differences or any changes in the repayment because of which the average maturity changes and it is not within the criteria that repayment schedule will not be approved by ad bankers and they will request you to change your repayment schedule alter your repayment schedule now we come to the next important topic uh, i know i've been using important topic for each topic that comes up because in ecb these are a few parameters and all of these parameters needs to be fulfilled even if we are not able to comply with any one of it it won't work hence each is important and all cumulatively conditions needs to be fulfilled if you want to take up the ecb so now the foreign currency ecb what is the benchmark uh, rate that can be paid that is the ceiling now here are they saying this is the top most that's the max that you can pay anything below that if you want to pay not a problem at all but this is the highest that you are allowed to pay so earlier the benchmark was libor and now it has been changed to arr arr is alternative rate of return uh, there has been a lot of uh, discussion and uh, uh, deliberation over the change of the uh, rate the benchmark rate from libor to arr and what i also understand is taxman is also coming up with a session in the near future uh, describing the differences between uh, libor and arr and the implication that it has it has a deeper implications because of the change but currently there is a transition which has been allowed by rbi wherein it says if whatever is the existing ecb which has earlier linked with libor that can continue with libor and the uh, uh, olympus ceiling for them is libor plus 550 basis point for any new ecb that will happen for them the new benchmark rate which is will be arr and it will be arr plus 500 basis points that will be the spread and if it is the inr ecb is going to be 450 basis points uh, this is what is there now all in cost ceiling uh, would be within this limit now i have a question say for example a lot of indian companies are very very jugaadu i will just change the screen a uh, lot of uh, smart entrepreneurs and company cfos come to us and ask us a question madam we want to pay a higher rate this month this year and next year we will pay a lower rate such that our average all in cost ceiling is maintained and since rbi is anyways looking at an average maturity period i am sure the average all in cost ceiling would also work what do you think guys what answer i should give them yes yes go ahead and make the use of the average uh, uh, payment so pay higher right now and pay lower next year and get your average ceiling in line because yeah you are within the terms when it comes to the average all in cost ceiling so what do you think should we say a yes to the client and make them feel happy or should we say no
okay i have two people who is saying no i know guys it's it's hard to say no to our clients and to what they wish but in this case we will have to say no and yes we will have to say a big no because when it comes to average maturity it was the uh, average calculation which rbi has asked but when it comes to all in cost ceiling rbi is very clear via an faq that you need to maintain the all in cost ceiling at all times uh, you cannot have an average wala calculation here rbi says don't get smart jahan mujhe average chahiye wahi mujhe average chahiye you can't start using averages at all places it is not permitted and we'll have to say a big no let's move further and understand what more conditions and what is more left out to understand in the condition so this is the limit and the leverage part of it uh, we are moving closer towards um, understanding less and less conditions and uh, identifying okay abhi conditions khatam hone ko aa rahi so first of all any eligible borrower can raise ecb up to usd 750 million or equivalent per financial year under the automatic route now what you need to maintain for that is that ecb raise from direct foreign equity holder your ecb liability equity ratio has to be uh, within 7 is to 1 the ratio cannot go beyond that but rbi has given a leeway saying that if you are raising only 5 million usd then in that case we will not uh, stress you with this liability equity ratio that is not taken into account we don't need to look at it but in rest scenario it is important that liability equity ratio is maintained further it also says that if you have multiple uh, any borrowing 7 is to 1 to theek hai but uske alawa if you are in a particular sector like ndfc and they you have you know your own uh, regulator regulatory body also uh, having some guidelines on the ratio of debt to equity then that so you have to maintain rbi says our conditions are addition to whatever already you are following because of your sectoral stuff uh, that you need to follow now this is an important term in the ecb liability equity stuff is that what if we have uh, multiple uh, outstanding then in that case you have to include all the outstandings of your ecb even the proposed one of the ecb needs to be included when you are calculating the ecb liability equity ratio the second important point is what to do in uh, case of uh, equity calculation should we include paid up capital of course we will include what about the free reserves should we include the free reserves and should we include the share premium which is received in foreign currency the answer is yes you can include the free reserves that is the share premium but the very very important point here is one of my clients came to me and said nikki uh, 31st march ki jo balance sheet hai uske hisab se to equity calculate kar liya but now i have raised funds equity capital in the month of march end and that has share premium in foreign currency now they want to raise capital in may can they use the share premium which was raised in april in the ecb equity calculation now i'm looking to hear a yes and a no that's if there is a share premium that has come in the month of april now we are raising the funds in the month of may while calculating the equity the funds have come in already the share premium is there i am creating a balance sheet of 31st of 30th of april uh, whether the share premium should be included in the calculation of equity come on guys iska answer nahi hai so now i am expecting answer ab tak ke sab ke answers the and i got a very nice yes and no coming in okay so i am getting yes 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 should be good nice answers flowing in uh, but as i said as consultants at times we have to do the hard things and here is another hard thing that we have to do yes sojan is very right uh, that it is said as per latest audited balance sheet so the latest audited balance sheet say it was of 31st of march april ka mid term mein audit nahi hua hai so it is not the audited balance sheet and hence you cannot take the march ka share premium into calculation you will have to go as per the latest audited balance sheet and the share premium which is reflected in the latest audited balance sheet is what you can consider or if you are very very faithful to your clients and you are agreeing and the client is agreeing to do a mid term audit and have an audited balance sheet created mid year 
then you can use it. But otherwise, data is audited balance sheet. Those are the important words that needs to be taken into account. Further, one more point important here is uh, the ECB and equity. If there are different foreign equity holders, then that calculation needs to be done. The ECB liability equity ratio needs to be calculated with respect to each foreign equity holder. Uh, and the last important point here is, which was also part of one of the questions in the chat box, which I just oversee, that if there is any loss, if there is any debit balance in the profit and loss account, as per the latest audited balance sheet, then it needs to be reduced from the equity calculation. <coughs> I'm sorry. So as we would have added the profits, if there is loss to the net worth, that needs to be reduced in the calculation of equity. That will be the effect in the denominator. <coughs> now the important aspects which we always are supposed to do it as the compliance people is the reporting requirement. So let's understand what reporting RBI has told us. RBI is pretty clear here saying that any ECB related work, don't come to me directly. Go to your AD bankers. AD bankers are capable to take care of the stuff. If there is anything related to approval that you want, still you come to me via the AD bankers. So that is one thing very clear. Secondly, when do you do this transaction? If your clients tell you that, okay, or if there is a company who is intending to raise funds, first thing they need to do is they can create a draft ECB agreement. Uh, go to your AD banker. We need to fill up form ECB. Form ECB, earlier it was form 83. Uh, recently, a couple of, uh, I think now years is the right word rather than months. It has been changed to form ECB, which needs to be filled in duplicate and submitted with the AD banker, detailing everything from whom you are borrowing, at what rate you plan to borrow, what is your repayment schedule, where do you plan to use. That's a detailed form that needs to be filled. One thing very, very important, RBI has been very particular in mentioning it, specifically mentioning it, is that please fill the form fully. If something which is not applicable to you, write not applicable. And if something which is applicable to you, do not write dash, write nil. But look, ye ek provision in the ECB has really caught my eyes that RBI has gone to the extent of writing it in the provision that please fill up nil or not applicable. Do not leave any column blank. This is a part of the uh, provision, clearly stating it like that. So hence, before you do any drawdown, remember if you go ahead and do the drawdown and then you go to RBI for the loan registration number or the approval, then that is a violation. And you'll have to go for compounding or late fee. But here, uh, before you receive the funds, you need to go to RBI, submit this form, tell them that whatever fees charge, anything is there, is gonna be paid up separately. Uh, get the LRN, which usually comes up pretty quickly once they review all your documents. Uh, and after you have received the LRN, post that only you can draw down, you can take the amount into your company's bank account and utilize it. Even when utilization happens, a complete record of where the funds that has been borrowed via ECB are being used because as uh, consultants, when we file form ECB2, which is a monthly return, we need to give in detail every rupee that has been used and where it has been used needs to be reported. And hence, this uh, uh, separately, you know, you need to make sure that uh, there is a tracking of where the funds are being used. Uh, secondly, if there is any change in the terms and conditions of the ECB, that also we need to report to RBI within seven days. The process is similar. You need to again file form ECB. It's almost like uh, the fresh process, uh, but RBI gives you permission in those cases. Monthly form ECB2 needs to reach to them uh, before the 7th of the next, uh, for the prior month by 7th is what it needs to reach to them. And all the details needs to be filled in it. And even a chartered accountant need to certify the form ECB2 about uh, whether the you know utilization, everything is placed, repayment has been done. All those details needs to be captured in form ECB2. Now we're moving towards further and on the last part, what if we have not done all this? What is the implication that comes up? So RBI says um, implication earlier was compounding. Now, since 2017, RBI has uh, come up and said, okay, uh, there is change and uh, LSF can be paid. This LSF, especially with regards to ECB is more recent. I'm missing on the date when it came, but recently this is the provision that's coming. That if 
you have delay in filing form ecb or there is a delay in filing form ecb2 or if there is any change in the ecb and you are making the filing that is revised ecb form then in each case for the delay you have to pay 7 and a half thousand plus 0.25% of the amount that is involved in the contravention multiplied by the period in which pretty simple calculation uh, but here an important point for all of us is that rbi has given a leeway that if whatever filing you are doing within this 3 years you know if you are doing the filing for whatever was your uh, you know non contraventions in the previous year but if you are filing in this 3 years a kind of an amnesty scheme amnesty is not the word rbi uses but i am putting it up in a general parlance and that a kind of amnesty scheme is rbi come up with saying that if you are making your non compliances regularizing it within this 3 years for whatever was the previous year even if you have missed filing nil return you are very very important to notice that if what a lot of people do mistake is that when they have receive ecb they file the form suppose for example you had brought down 20 crores 20 crores jab tak use ho rahe the ecb 2 form bharte rahe now that is utilized completely in say 6 months or a years time but repayment is at the end of fourth year then till fourth year every month even if there is no transaction nil return needs to be filed even if you forget filing one nil return the non compliance late fee penalty is the same as mentioned in the screen so if you find that any of your clients or your companies have had any non compliance in the past this is the right time to take advantage of it wherein rbi will not go for any further penalties or any compounding or details scrutiny but by payment of lsf we can regularize the non compliance i think this is a very good window right now which rbi has given us and we need to make the maximum use of this window and get the regularization done for whatever non compliances that are pending for our clients or for any of the companies for that matter <clears throat> now most of the compliances uh, is done we know what needs to be done so next step comes it what if in case any of the company changes their mind for whatever reason you know they found that they want to issue equity or don't want to make the repayment or they are not capable of making the repayment is it allowed rbi says yes if you were originally permitted to allowed you know to take the fdi in the first place then in that case we will allow you to uh, convert your ecb into uh, fdi which is equity and you don't need to come to us for that it is also under automatic route uh, but if it was not allowed matlab fdi bhi approval route se hai to conversion bhi approval route se hoga rest you don't need to come to me you have to follow your sectoral guidelines uske andar karo whatever are the guidelines of fdi which is the pricing guidelines uh, that you need to take make sure ke jo aapki equity ki value hai wahi rate pe aap cover kar rahe ho fdi ki sari guidelines maintain kar rahe ho your lender se aap consent le rahe ho then you are allowed mutually aap decide karo which date what rate you want to convert don't make sure you don't give any loss to the country then you can convert in full or in part so there is no restriction if you have borrowed 20 crores you need to borrow uh, convert completely 20 you can choose to repay 15 crore convert only 5 or vice versa wo sare matter mein rbi is quite flexible now one again uh, i saw lollipop given by ecb uh, for startups so rbi said that sab log startups ke liye itna kuch kar rahe hai to hum piche kyu reh jaye so there is a separate rule uh, for uh, startups under the ecb guidelines Uh, guys there is no major difference here except for a couple of differences one is that if you are an entity recognized as a startup by the central government when dipp registered startup ho so hi aap yahan pe eligible ho secondly it says 3 million usd or its equivalent tak aap karo borrowing koi problem nahi hai aapko main jo ecb equity liability wala jo ratio tha wo aapko main uh, leeway deta hu you can live without it not required secondly mutually agree karo all in cost ko and minimum average maturity 3 years rest all conditions remains the same for them as well but these are a few uh, specific advantages rbi has given to them conversion is also same which is there for other but all of this if you are doing it for a startup you need to look at the specific provision relating to startup which has been mentioned by rbi uh, so guys we are through with the ecb part of it but associated with ecb one more important part is the trade credit part of it in case of trade credit uh, whatever is the buyer's credit or the supplier's credit that is if you are borrowing a person resident in india is say acting as an importer then in that case he can use both 
how you had ecb in foreign currency and inr similarly you have uh, uh, trade credit also in both the stuff eh? trade credit is directly by the overseas supplier bank or financial institution or your lender which is mostly for import of capital goods but also for non capital goods as well uh, there is a limit for which you can do the trade credit which is up to usd 150 million for import transaction for oil gas refining and uh, co companies specific companies for others it is 50 million dada nahi denge to usko and for suppliers credit uh, who are the recognized lenders is the suppliers of goods located outside india for buyers credits banks and foreign equity holders and all now main important is what is the periodicity if the period is if it is you know a shipment uh, of capital good then it is 3 years you are allowed to use the credit for a period of 3 years if it is a non capital good then a period is 1 year or whatever is the operating cycle you know of the company whichever is less that is the period that is allowed and there is another special uh, case which is of shipyards or ship builders in those case they have given the import of non capital goods to be 3 years again there is a separate all in cost ceiling for uh, trade credit if it is a foreign currency it is 350 basis point for libor related for new uh, it will be 300 if it is inr it is 250 basis point exchange rate and all is you know whatever uh, make sure that it is uh, you are allowed to change the currency from one to another but there should not be any uh, loss to india so inr se foreign currency mein bologe so not permitted foreign currency se inr mein aana hai so permitted not a problem at all again an important aspect that needs to be considered in the ecb front was on the hedging aspect of it that if you are taking a foreign currency uh, loan then you need to compulsory hedge your borrowing if it is inr obviously hedging is not required so whenever you are going ahead and deciding whether to go for an ecb borrowing or a inr borrowing sorry foreign currency borrowing or inr hedging and the compliances relating to hedging needs to be looked into account if you have a natural hedging uh, then in that case uh, there is some relaxations which has been given uh, in case of natural uh, hedging scenarios uh, this is all guys uh, this is the a community wherein we try to solve each other's problems and relating to tax and fema you can choose to scan the qr code and join the community or connect with us we will be able to help each other and solve the more uh, complex cases of tax and fema uh, we'll look forward to the questions now quickly use another 5 7 minutes for the questions part of it if a company is non compliant with the regulations for 5 uh, years if a company is non compliant with the regulation for 5 years can, can still can they still opt for the lsf route and if so there are any specific procedure mentioned uh, by rbi uh, yes if uh, see the rbi provision says that if and if you are non compliant first of all you need to regularize your transaction if you are regularizing your transaction Uh, post regularization you will have to pay the lsf and get uh, the regularize uh, you know get your compliances in order uh, so your in fact we have recently done one of the cases wherein the non compliance was from the period of 2008 so uh, there is nothing like you know now only you have to do it we did a compliances for them which was pending since 2008 so like what 15 years older also can be done second question is can indian company in the defense sector manufacturing raise ecb from fta fatf compliant uh, jurisdiction company uh, pradeep ji uh, you have to look at the sectoral conditions for the defense sector if there are conditions without any conditions if it is allowed in the defense sector then only ecb will be allowed if there are conditions to it it will not be allowed we will have to look at the specific sector conditions to answer to this particular question fti ke uh, specific conditions what are the fines and penalties in case if the changes to ecb are not reported to rbi uh, shridharan whatever penalties we saw in the lsf uh, whenever there is a change you need to file form revised ecb needs to be filed and if there is a delay in filing of the revised ecb again that 7 and a half thousand ka penalty that we saw in the lsf for the period and the amount matlab into the amount and the number of years of delay 
that calculation needs to be done to arrive at the penalty figure. Okay. Can we take? There is a long question with eight questions. I would love to take it up little later. Tell me if all simple questions. Um, is write off of ECB allowed in case of inability to borrow or inability of the borrower to repay the liability? Uh, Neeraj, there is nothing specifically talked about write off in the provisions, which means that if you want to write off, you will have to go to RBI and take the permission. Usually, my experience says that yes, write off may be allowed because India ko loss nahi hai. But uh, at times, the better option is to get it converted into equity if both the parties agree to do so. Uh, is prepayment of ECB uh, is prepayment of ECB uh, allowed before MA minimum average maturity period in case the hundred percent holding parent wishes to sell the Indian entity or liquidate the entity? See, unless the minimum average maturity period is completed, uh, RBI does not allow anything. Uh, if there is anything specific, as in your case, you are saying that they intend to sell. At times, there are you know global level structures that happen because of which uh, there are implications into the Indian entity. Uh, in such specific cases, we need to go to RBI and ask for specific permissions to go ahead for it. What about SOFR benchmark? Yes, SOFR benchmark is also one of the benchmarks which is included in the. Uh, ARR uh, criteria because there are a couple of uh, them also. Uh, what we also see is that yes, practically people are today using SOFR as one of the benchmarks uh, for uh, for ECB in the current times after the new change coming into the picture. The ECB is raised. The ECB is received in Indian rupees from foreign indirect equity holder for working capital purposes with the minimum average maturity period of five years. Can we re repay this ECB before minimum average maturity, say the fourth year up to the full repayment? As I said, uh, minimum average maturity period needs to be compulsorily met in all the cases, depending upon the usage that we have. If for any reason we need to do it earlier, then in that case, we need to go to RBI and take special permission for the same. <clears throat> Can we take a fresh ECB for repayment of old ECBs? Yes, we can. Uh, we have if foreign currency linked with LIBOR. Now LIBOR is discontinued. Is it compulsory to revise the ECB agreement? No, you're allowed to continue LIBOR for all the previous ones. But if you're taking any new, then all your new will go under the uh, ARR as the new benchmark. Can we file a revised ECB with the bank for extending the maturity period? Yes, you can. What will be the beneficial what will be beneficial for the organization, ECB or FBI? Uh, this is a very a commercial question, uh, understanding. See, if an Indian company is borrowing, they need to look at it commercially. Uh, if this is not a call which we take it as compliance perspective, but they need to look at it if the company feels that using the borrowing, even our, which comes at a cost, company can increase the valuation. And hence, whenever they will do the dilution of their equity, it will be much higher at a later stage then in that scenario, ECB could be preferred over FDI. Usually ECB will not come in unless there is a foreign equity holder already existing in the company, in which cases what we suggest is you can have an FDI to a portion and uh, if the company wants to take the advantage of the uh, cost, interest cost, and the holding company wants to have a return on a regular basis, then ECB route can be or should be explored. In ECB2, we are supposed to report the actual interest amount paid or accrued interest amount. Actual whatever is paid needs to be reported. ECB liability equity ratio can be negative. Oh, wow, we are doing nice. Uh, negative balance. That is interesting case, specific case looked into it. Can we use the ECB fund for fixed deposits? No, you can park the ECB funds till you are uh, you know, uh, using it. So ECB parking is allowed. <clears throat> and specifically where to park is also mentioned in the law. We need to look at into it. There are a couple of uh, provisions which we have not taken due to the paucity of time to complete the entire sum in one hour, which is like traceability of ASOPs, a few specifics for a few sectors, and parking of ECB funds. If in specific cases, we can go back to the master directions and have a look at it. 
How do we know that the ECB form two is delayed? Suppose we submitted it with the bank on seven, but AD Bank was not able to submit with the ECB two. How do we know the ECB two is delayed? You need to have your uh, ECB two form that you have submit acknowledgement copy with it that you have submitted to the bank. That copy you should have, <clears throat> which justifies your case that you have done it within the time line. <clears throat> Whew. Sorry, I'm taking too fast so that we completed within the timeline. Uh, steel bar manufacturing company wants to modernize facilities and want to raise from Israel company can corporate can corporate must have a relation with Indian company. As I said, you need to make sure that the recognized lender is there to uh, give the ECB. Unless there is a recognized lender in place, it cannot be done. What if the shareholding does not meet the requirement? It is not allowed. You need to be a recognized lender. Uh, I think we have taken most of the questions on the Q and A front. If there are more questions, we are happy to tape it up, or we can close the session too. Preeti, we are six within the tube. Would you like me to take up one or two questions or close the session as you suggest? Uh, so we can close the session. Uh, in case there is any question, they can post it directly to your email ID or sales at taxman.com. Sure. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you, Ms. Shah, for your outstanding presentation and a clear and concise explanation of the subject matter. We greatly appreciate the effort that you've put into making this session a success. I would also like to extend my gratitude to the participants for their cooperation. Your contributions are a vital component for the session success, and we could not have done it without. Although we have attempted to address all the queries raised during the session, please feel free to reach us at in writing at salesattaxman.com. Thank you all again. We look forward to presenting another vital topic to you soon. Until then, take care and have a wonderful time. Thank you so much, everybody, for the patient hearing. And I hope we could add some value. And thank you, Taxman, once again. Thank you, Yusuf and Kriti. Kriti? Uh, thank you, ma'am.